for Dorsey and Publishing at Red Stick Reads, our local bookstore. My name is Kelsey Sibley. I'm the program coordinator for the LSU Writer Center for Media and Public Affairs at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication. Um, a few housekeeping notes. First, please silence your cell phones um, just so we don't get any like ringing during the conversation. Um, however, we do highly, highly, highly propose that you choose to use social media throughout this using our hashtag LSU Diversity and Publishing. Um, second, we have reserved a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A with our audience, um, but we will be holding on to the mic. Um, so whenever you have a question, raise your hand. One of our team members will come to you with the mic and we'll hold it for you so you can kind of ask your question. Um, and now I'm super excited to introduce our Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at the Manchester School, Dr. Megan Sanders, to introduce our moderator and today's panel. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out this late afternoon on a Friday. We're really excited to host you for this panel. As Kelsey mentioned, I'm Dr. Megan Sanders, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce today's panel to explore the challenges of diversifying the publishing industry. It's no secret that the world of publishing has a distinctly white history, and that has long been reflected in the stories that are put forth in the mainstream and general bargain. According to a study done by Assistant Professor of English and Cultural Analytics at McGill University, Richard Jean So, and writer and graphics editor of Opinion, Gus Rosarek, 95% of books published by the major publishing houses between 1950 and 2018 were written by white authors. While author diversity has increased in recent years, it is still predominantly a white industry. All of the leaders of the major, pu major publishing houses are white, and according to a 2019 survey, so are 85% of the people who acquire and edit books. However, like all forms of media, change is happening in the industry, and tonight's panelists are an example of that change. To moderate this evening, we have Trinity Green. Trinity is a senior mass communication major with a concentration in broadcast journalism from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is also the current president of the National Association of Black Journalists at LSU, as well as the executive director of student entertainment and student government, and a member of the Ada Kappa chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. After graduation, she hopes to work in television production with the ultimate goal of one day owning a production studio. Get me up when you that. <laughs> with that, I will turn it over to Trinity. All right, all right. Use that mic. I'll take this one. Hello everyone, um, like she said, my name is Trinity Green, um, and today we have a great group of amazing ladies here for you today. Um, panelists, I'll come to each of you and ask if you can introduce yourself and tell us why um, or how you connected to the publishing industry. Yeah, so. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, hello. I am Farah Roshan. I am the author of 40 plus... Uh, books, mostly romance, black romance, and now young adult. Um, and that's how I'm connected. I do the writing. Uh, like I said, I've been writing for about 15 years now, and I'm actually a local from the River Parishes. Um, and yeah, that's me. Hi, my name is Jacinta Saffold. I am a professor at the University of New Orleans and the Endowed Chair for Africana Studies. Um, my research focuses on African American literature, specifically popular fiction from the 1990s and early 2000s. I have a digital humanities project called the Essence Book Project, where I digitize the bestsellers list that was published in Essence Magazine from 1994 to 2010 to be able to make sense of what a black reading communities prioritize at the turn of the new millennium. Hi, I'm Krishan Trotman. I'm the publisher of Legacy Lit, an imprint at Hachette Book Group in New York. And I'm happy to be here with the other panelists. Okay, okay, yeah, I can hear myself. 
Um, I'm Gina DuVernay, I'm a librarian and archivist and cultural consultant, and my connection to publishing is I collect books as a librarian, so whatever, I can't collect what's not public, so to make it available for patrons, so that's how I'm connected to the publishing world. I'm starting with Ms. DuVernay, can you please share what was the thing that made you want to pursue a career connected to publishing and storytelling? This might sound simple, but uh, it's because I love to read. So I have been reading since, I mean, I'm going to date myself, but I mean, I recall being obsessed with Sweet Valley Twins and the Babysitter's Club. And then, um, but my mind was truly blown when I was in, I guess it was like Beat Dalton, I think it was called. It was like one of those bookstores in the mall. Yeah. And um, I saw a book, and I was like, should I be looking at this? Is this, is this, is this okay? Because it was a bookshelf with a couple of shelves for African American titles there. And it was called Black Boy. And I was like, ooh, I'm into black boys. I'm gonna get this. I'm 12. I, I probably, Richard Wright might be a little bit too much for me, but it wasn't. And that was the start of my real love of black literature. And from then on, I never read another Sweet Valley Twin Babysitter's Club book ever again. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, my mom was a huge Stephen King fan, and she used to have us read either Stephen King to her or the newspaper. And I was really good at reading, and she was really happy when she saw me reading, even though Stephen King scares the crap out of me. And it just turned into a sick sort of thing, because I would have to, I'm like, I'm scared of everything. But she loved horror. She was just like fascinated with anything horror. She was like the sweetest person in the world. But um, yeah, I started with my mom and her love for books, and trickled down to me, and I became an English major. Um, and then, uh, but I didn't want to be a teacher or a lawyer, and I discovered publishing. Um, an editor came into our uh, school one day, and she was like this, she looked like she just stepped out of Essence Magazine in my head at that time. She was fashionable and like gorgeous, and it told us about all the books that she was doing that I had never read before, and in school we were reading classics for mainly old white men. <laughs> And she was doing all these like multicultural fiction and nonfiction books, so I just thanked her for an internship. So that's how I got started. So I'm gonna go against the grain and just say I was not a strong reader. I wasn't. Um, I went to a French immersion elementary school and I learned to read in French, read and write in French before I did English. So by the time we got to English, I was very confused. <laughs> And, and I really struggled to read um, initially, um, but around middle school, I don't want to date myself too much, um, I too discovered some books that maybe I should have been reading at that time, but they were coming of age narratives that really reflected the kinds of realities that I was facing every day. And I really enjoyed those books, and so I would go to the library as often as I could, and I would take the books to the left of that one and to the right of that one, and just read as much as I could. Um, my mother <laughs> is an English teacher as well, and so she knew the contents of those books <laughs> because her students were reading them. And so she would often say, you can't read that quite yet. You have to wait. And one book in particular, The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier became a writer passage because my mother insisted that I had to wait until I was a freshman in high school to be able to read it. And my freshman year, I was so excited to read it. One of my, my English teacher, incidentally, my mom and her worked together before then, um, said that we could pick any book we wanted to, to for our book report or whatever we were doing. And so I picked the coldest winter ever. And she came to me and she said, Jacinta, I'm very disappointed. I expected you to pick something a little more challenging for yourself. And that really bothered me because what could be more challenging than my life? And that really stuck with me and, and really propelled me to be a champion of books, especially black popular books. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> 
I, uh, I am too the daughter of an English teacher. Uh, and I come from a family of readers and a family of romance readers. My great aunt, um, I know that woman had 6,000 Harlequins. Um, she did. Every Penny Jordan and Carol Marlboro book, she truly owned them all. And uh, my mom's sisters, they all read Jackie Collins and Danielle Steele. So talk about what you shouldn't be reading at 12. <laughs> Lucky Santangelo should not be someone that a 12 year old knows about, but I did. So I guess that is, I see a lot of you are too young to even know who Lucky Santangelo is. And um, but if you've ever read the Jackie Collins, you know that you should not. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's where I cut my teeth. Yeah, um, so that's how I write romance. But it also, it's just something that I grew up seeing. And believe it or not, I was not going to be like a writer or a romance writer. Because once I went to college, everyone, they were so into like the more intellectual books. And I remember every Oprah Reading Club book. That's what you should have been reading. I hated them all. They made me feel so just depressed. So I would pretend that I loved them and I would talk about them and then I would sneak the romances and read what made me happy. So those are the kind of books that I thought I was going to write when I decided I was going to be a writer. And then I decided I wanted to be happy because life is short. So I turned to romance. And <laughs> that's just, uh, that's how I, I got to be where I am now. Yeah. So in 1967, Toni Morrison joined Random House as an editor, and over 800 books published during her time there, 3.3% of those were written by black authors. After she left Random House, only two books were published by black authors between 1984 and 1990. So my question to you ladies are, as a black woman working in working in and adjacent to the industry, what are some of the things you see as challenges to getting stories published by non-white authors? Who wants to tackle that much first? I mean, it's like, how much time do you have? Um, because, you know, it's funny how you say that, that statistic, only two African-American authors who were published between like several years. Um, that's kind of where I was when I first came into the industry. Um, because it was before self-publishing opened the industry to authors of color. I truly believe that's what has made the, um, you know, that's why there are so many authors of color now, especially in my genre, because of self-publishing. Because before the gatekeepers decided, yeah, we only have room for these few people. Um, and even with that, it's still, it's still hard to get your foot in the door. But when I first came in, there were two authors. Uh, the year I started with Harlequin, they, they took two black authors on, myself and another. Um, and it was, yeah, it was hard. It remains hard because you have to prove that there's an audience for your books. Unlike the white authors, you know, when they would publish a book and it maybe didn't sell as well, that was, excuses were made. If it happened with the black author, it's because there's not an audience for that book. So we, we had to suffer that, where white authors just, they made excuses for why the books didn't sell. It wasn't because of the audience. So, so in my research and conversations with uh, black best-selling authors, a theme has arisen um, in a lot of their responses. One, the idea of self-publishing. A lot of them um, did get their start in self-publishing and had to prove that there was an audience. In fact, that was the whole impetus around Essence Magazine creating a bestsellers list, specifically pulling from um, Black-owned bookstores across the United States and Canada because a lot of uh, Black authors were self-publishing at the time and those self-published works were not being captured by things like Nielsen's Book Scan or the New York Times and some of the other kind of major industry markers. And so it was a way to be able to prove that there really is a community of readers out there um, that uh, the, the 
major five publishers are not tapping into. Um, but what is really frustrating that I, I have seen happen um, from the boom of uh, publishing that happened in the 1990s, especially after the uh, box office success of Terry McMillan, was that um, these books were taken out of the communities that they were successful in. They were stripped of the things that made them bestsellers in the first place, right? the ways that these books were intentionally moving through black communities was not something that uh, major publishers, when they would go in and then republish those texts, would prioritize. And so eventually, these books went from, you know, the, the barely being able to keep them on the shelf to being sold for pennies on Amazon. And that meant that a lot of these authors that had, you know, amazing careers were no longer uh, viable. A lot of them ended up having their books literally given away as e-books. And they had no, no control over that. And a number of other things that happened um, when these books were taken out of the communities that supported them. And um, so I, I really see community as an important uh, foundation for the success of, of Black books. I totally agree with that. It's one of our sort of big um, mission or visions for Legacy Wood. But um, it's community. So I think one of the, um, the hurdles has always been marketing. Um, it's just when you have a black, when, when you have a black person writing romance, it's a black romance. But when a white person is writing romance, it's a romance. And publishers just have a a hard time just taking away that it's a black woman behind the book. Um, so it, it creates less opportunities in a lot in, in some ways um, because, you know, this is how we see you, so you go in this box, whereas um, a non-black uh, romance writer may have different sort of spaces that they can operate in. So I think that the um, publicity and marketing is always been a huge hurdle. Right now they're hiring and a lot of black editors, which is what they usually do when there's an outcry for my, more diversity. Um, but they definitely need more uh, professionals in the marketing and publicity space that um, can champion um, black writers because um, we do read everywhere, we read wide. and. It is not easy to really understand that unless you really just know that know the culture and I just think the deficiency and the marketing publicity is really gonna make whatever ha what's happening now with publicity just either do better or just not perform at all and then the writers will be blamed that their books are not selling, the readers, you guys don't read enough, etc. Well, I agree with everything you've all said, so I can't repeat it, so I'm just going to comment on a couple of things. Um, but when you were talking about community, it's really important because when, as a librarian, if you're doing collection development, it's hard to collect for the community you serve when those books aren't even showing up on, like, the list for you to buy from. Um, but you know your community, and you know that's what they're reading. They're reading, you know, yeah. say, like a Terry McMillan book. I mean, because... Terry McMillan was right up there with Essence, right? That was what's on the coffee table in a black home. Your mother was reading Terry McMillan, all the hearts I read, and all of those books. Um, and so to, like, I don't know. I mean, as a child, I thought everybody was re reading these books, right? But then you get out in the world and you realize they don't know who Terry McMillan is until, what, her third book, To Wait to Exhale. And she was on the bestseller list, and it's like, well, who's this lady? And how is she selling these books? Well, because the people are reading them. And I was just reading an article, kind of similar to romance um, books, but I was reading an article about um, black mystery writers and how they're saying that the article was basically saying that they don't do well written by black women because white people cannot relate to the characters in a black mystery. But, but somehow we can relate to white author, white characters in a mystery. It just it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't actually make sense, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's the story of my life, my professional life. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's it's been in romance, and I know we have a bunch of questions, but I just have to uh, <laughs> because it's one of my pet peeves. Um, you know, you have things like 
paranormal romance with chick chifters and vampires, but you hear people say you can't relate to a black character, but they love a vampire romance. And it's like, yeah, that's not gelling at all. Um, and you you were speaking about the, the marketing side. Um, I think, Kelsey, are some, one of you mentioned the part of like 85% of publishing is white. I think that is one of the reasons, and also the fact that so much is based in New York, which is a very expensive city. Publishing does not pay well. So a lot of those people who are in publishing tend to be white people whose families can support them, you know, to live in New York while making $38,000. So when you have that, yeah, they're not going to know how to promote a book that you would find in a beauty shop. You know, the, the book that's being read in a beauty shop in Atlanta. Those people, they can't relate to it because they don't know those people, but that's what publishing is. So, it, it's, it, that's what feeds it. Yeah. And I just want to follow up since we're talking about Terry McMillan. Terry McMillan, um, in the, with her first day human albums, Mama and um, I'm looking on the second one. Oh, uh, Disappearing Acts, which is also yeah. turned into a great film with uh, anyway, so not late. <laughs> um, she did a lot of self marketing and promotion. She was working at a uh, legal firm and she would stay after hours and use the fax machine and all the other kind of dated um, digital uh, communication tools to uh, reach out to black fraternities and sororities, black church groups, other uh, community organizations and say, hey, I have this book out here. I'd love to come and talk to your group about it. And, and so a lot of book clubs around the country invited her to speak. I, I found that um, the uh, chapter of Delta Sigma Theta in, at my hometown had her come and speak because she had reached out to them um, and nothing more than that. And so uh, uh, and I, the list could go on, you know, Omar Tarby has beautiful stories about the ways that he would promote his books on uh, college campuses because he was a Howard University student when he was writing his first novels. A lot of black authors have to go above and beyond what is normally expected of authors to go in and show, you know, their publisher how to market their books to their communities. And, and it's frustrating because they do all of this work, they get successful, and then all of a sudden, all of the things that they did on the way up are no longer the things that the publisher will continue to do on their behalf, when that's really what should absolutely be happening. So speaking on change um, now, in what ways has the industry, industry changed since you started your career? And what are some of the challenges to change in an industry like publishing, where so much of the history is tied to preserving white stories? Well, I'm desperate for some black stories. <laughs> the thing is that I, I mean, it's, it's just strange, but we get a lot of history, black history books from uh, submissions from non-black writers, and I just don't know why. And and I just, I think, you know, it, maybe it's just because it's hard to get an agent. Um, you know, there's less, it, it's, it's, it costs, you know, time and money to do the research. I don't know what it is, but I always encourage, uh, if you have a book idea, try to put something down on paper for a proposal and submit it and, and um, see what happens. But I do think that there's a there's definitely a deficiency in people that are even sending in the proposals. It's just um, a lot of the books that I get right now, now that they know that I'm a black woman leading an imprint, are a lot of memoir. And I was just telling someone today that um, I just think it's because the agents, a lot of their agents are white and they don't really understand how this could go beyond that person's life story or like because the agent's job is usually to help you sort of figure out what the book is how to shape it because you can have one idea that can turn into like three different books so the agent's job is a good agent helps you like figure out what the best book to sell is what's marketable but i just feel that a lot of them here like see a black person oh that black person went through a lot you should write a memoir and <laughs> 
Uh, a lot of the books that I do that are not memoirs because I go out there and I find them myself. I'll just say I, it's odd to me that um, black books are back in vogue in a way. Um, and it, it, I study the 1990s and early 2000s, which arguably it was the largest boom in African American publishing since the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and when I want, when I was a graduate student and told my professors that that's what I wanted to study, they laughed at me and said, "You won't get a job." They were right. It, it, it has been a very difficult road, and to see the kind of 180 shift that has happened in the wake of the uh, murder of George Floyd has been astounding to me. The ways that there has been an outcry for more uh, black stories is just perplexing to me. For example, I um, interviewed um, best friends and co-authors, Virginia DeBerry and Donna Grant, recently. Um, they had three bestsellers on the Essence bestsellers list, and in the wake of um, the murder of George Floyd, their publisher came back to them and said they were interested in uh, re-releasing all three of their best-selling titles because of this new demand. And they were really excited about it, as they should be, but it, it just brought up uh, what they call the Tony Terry problem. Where do you fit in as a black author if you are not Tony Morrison or Terry McMillan? This is still going to be a, a problem, especially in light of how many black authors, new black authors that are coming up to the fore and those that are being re up that emerging, you know. And so I, I am excited for this reinvigorating moment, but I'm also very cautious of the sort of optimism that is, is coming to the fore at the moment because I, I, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, unfortunately. Well, it comes in waves. I mean, you just said it's sort of like, okay, oh no, let's respond. George Floyd happened. There are protests. People are saying, let's let's start. We we should have a black book. We need a black author. Let's find. Let's go to Twitter. Everybody black that has a book, a manuscript, send it in. Submissions open. That's exactly how it happened. I know. I know. So it's, it goes in waves, right? Unfortunately. It, we call it the George Floyd effect. That's what my friends and I call it. For a while, every publisher had a black, we, we see the time of the black square on Instagram. You know, there was like that week, every, everybody had a black square on Instagram. Um, but they actually, it, it came before. Um, the George Floyd effect, uh, effect happened recently. But what I've seen, um, since I started back in whatever, 2007, 2008, um, I, I mentioned how self-publishing has had this effect. Uh, and I'm speaking as a romance writer because that's the genre I know best. But when I first started, you know, went the route with an agent, went to a publisher, um, we basically had two publishing houses that black authors could write for. Harlequin Kamani and Kensington Defina. That was it. Uh, you had the, I think we're down to the big four now. It was the big six at one time, or we're going to eventually be one publisher. But back in the day, when you had like a St. Martin's Press, they had one black author and that's all they needed. Uh, Pocket Books, uh, Avon, they all had their black authors and they didn't want any more. You could go to these other publishers, but they only had maybe eight or so authors that wrote for them. Um, so if you were a black author, you were just stuck if you could not get a publisher. But then Amazon made it super easy where you didn't have to do like a Elon Harris, you know, print 5,000 books and sell them out of the trunk of your car. That was cost prohibitive. Most authors who wanted to self-publish just couldn't do that. But Kindle made it easy. All you had to do was upload it. So black authors who could not get past the gatekeepers, started uploading their books to Amazon and started making real money. And Harlequin went from bringing in two authors, like I mentioned before, uh, the year they brought me in, two authors, to two years later, 
I found out that the um, the assistant editor, she spent the first two hours of her day every day looking at the Amazon list of the black authors who were on the top list and then reading their books and trying to approach them instead of the publisher, instead of the authors approaching the publisher, they were going out to approach them. And they brought in just a ton of black authors because the market showed them that there was an audience for it. They just were not open to it before. So it's like the audience will always show them that, uh, you know, what they want, because publishers just want to make money. They truly do. They don't care. Uh, they, they don't care. I know. I know you're sitting there as, yeah, you're sitting there as a publisher. Yeah. But the issue also is that um, from a publisher's perspective, we do want to make money. It's, it's helping everybody keep their jobs as well. Um, so that's what my thing is always like. Legacy needs to stay around. We need to make money. Um, because that's what they, that's what the, the higher ups really care about is profitability. Yeah. One thing that I think is a huge problem is that right now the George the George Floyd effect is also causing at least I know the nonfiction space right now is, um, authors to get enormous advances. I don't know if it's happening in the uh, in certain categories, but I mean. There, like a book that would have went for what I mean, a book that would have went for like fifty thousand in the two thousands were were now going for six figures. But now after George Floyd, books that would have went for you know like a low six figures is now going for a million plus one point five million. And for me, I always get worried for the author <laughs> because that's, that's not managing your career well, like because. Again, they care about profitability. So you have your one book that they paid a million dollars from for. They're supposed to put all the marketing and publicity into like this being the big book for the company. Um, the agents are happy about that because they get commission. But the author, if you don't make close to that, so you can sell a nice amount. You can sell like 25,000. It's hard to sell 25,000 copies of a book nowadays. It's really hard. But that's not going to be enough for you because they estimated that you were going to be making, that you're going to be um, turning out over 100,000 copies of that book. So what happened to your career is dead. You go back, they don't want to do another book with you. Sorry, it didn't perform. And this is what, this is going to be the second wave of the George Floyd. It's going to be, you can't do those type of books anymore, the black books, because they're not earning out. Even though we bought them at these huge advances, we let the agents understand that we're just hungry for this and that they can, this is what they're going for. So now you have authors, all types of come and say, oh, I just don't want to, I mean, my author, I mean, they only want to talk if you're spending a million dollars or you have to, if you don't, you can't even get a meeting with them unless you're going to do, unless you're going to make over 500,000 offer. I mean, this is like, it's out of control and the only people that are going to um, be hit with this are the, the authors again. And, and probably the black people like me that they hire. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we're going to be affected, our community, so it's an issue. I, and I would say that you, the people like Gina and myself, the, the historians and librarians, we're impacted by it as well. The um, ability to collect black books and ephemera today, it's, it's a different ballgame. Things that were going for literal pennies five years ago are are 50 times that amount and, and it makes it too difficult for um, black book collectors to be able to collect our own our own work and um, we often get priced out and those those the collections especially the collections of black authors are tending to go to um, white institutions which means that these white institutions will hold, uh, you know, our, the most precious thoughts and memories of our, our best black authors. And most often black people are not, uh, don't feel comfortable going in those spaces and accessing that, those kinds of works. And so the trickle down of, of these kinds of politics and the, the kind of money aspect of it is felt, you know, kind of writ large. Um, it just makes me think of a friend of mine who is a collector. He's been collecting for maybe 30 years, 40 years. And it was to the point where 
they would contact the black collector and say, oh, he might like these Frederick Douglass papers, or he might like this James Baldwin letter, or he might. And it's like, he did like it, and he could have bought it for five, ten, fifteen dollars. And now, huge collections are being sold to Yale because a lot of HBCUs, if you're looking at other, you know, other <laughs> institutions, they just cannot afford something that years ago went for so little. And no one wanted, that's the, the, the no one wanted them. He has a, a vast collection of materials that nobody wanted at the time. But now it's in vogue. And in vogue cost. And Ms. Farah, I'm um, talking about your career. In 2019, you were a part of a, a board walkout for the Romance Writers of America because of comments made by Courtney Milan uh, that she made about a fellow author portrayal of an Asian um, character being racist. Can you share what brought you to resign and what you believe WRA um, has done in the subsequent years to reckon with the controversy surrounding the organi organization's uh, racial reckoning? I actually can't say much because I signed an NDA. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no, really. Um, no, but if RWA is uh, Romance Writers of America, and it was at the time the largest um, organization, trade association for any genre. Um, there are 10,000 plus members all over the world. And it basically imploded because of racism. <laughs> um, you know, and the funny thing is, um, it was, I, I ended my 18 years of membership uh, by resigning with seven other authors of color who were on the board of directors. But um, I was a member for 18 years. It's how I learned to write and such. Um, but just as an organization, I was always made to feel like, um, be happy we allowed you in the sandbox. Don't ask for any of the toys. Just be happy you're in the sandbox. You know, it was like, that's just how they made us feel. I, I still remember at my very first conference uh, back in 2002 in Denver, there was like 2,000 people at the conference and I was one of 10 authors of color there. It was so very uncomfortable, but I dealt with it because that was the place, if you wanted to be an author, that was the place you went to and you were just happy that they left you in the sandbox and learn, you know, um, it, it's a place where you, if you wanted to get an agent, if you wanted to pitch to publishers, that's where you had to be as a romance writer. And it just gives you like a picture of how things were back then that you had to put up with that kind of racism just to get your foot in the door. Uh, and compare that to 2019 when everything imploded, it was because those or those people in the organization who had been there uh, for such a long time, they didn't like the fact that there were so many people of color, the fact that there were eight of us on the National Board of Directors, um, that was not even thought about, you know, back when I joined them back in 2002. There were just some of them who did not like it. And yeah, it killed an organization that did a lot of good despite um, how awful <laughs> some of the people were. It actually did a lot of good for authors, for aspiring authors, um, but racism killed it because those people just did not, they didn't like the fact that it was becoming, that equality was a thing. They liked the thought of authors of color being a step down from them. Um, and that really is all I should say about it because I did sign an NDA as a board well, thank member. You. <laughs> but, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. DuVernay, as a librarian um, and culture consultant and activist, what is a challenge you face the most in preserving stories from marginalized communities? Okay, I'm very much not an activist, but um, <laughs> So I, I will just put that in there, because when I think of that, that's just not, I'm a, a behind the scenes activist, a quintessential middle child, so everything's behind the scenes. Um, but I was smirking when you were talking, Vera, because it sounds so much like the library, right? Like, 
it's um yeah there there's there's there are like eight of us just about right so um yeah just it just it just had me thinking about the the parallels there but um can you repeat the question? Because I went on a tangent okay. thinking about live groups, right? I can talk about live groups all day. Yes. Okay. Marginalized, something about marginalized people. Uh, yes, it's what is the challenge you face the most in preserving stories from marginalized communities? Well, the, I think that is a lot of, of preserving that history when you're working at. Um, I, I'm just going back on the experience that I had as working as an archivist um, for a, a PWI, predominantly white institution. Um, a lot of the job is convincing your white colleagues that this should be preserved in the first place. That's the 80% of the job, is to convince that this should be here. I know it should be here, right? And But that's, that's every meeting, meeting, you know, speaking with donors is trying to get this you know, now I'm a, I'm a salesperson. I have to make this big pitch. Um, so that that really is the hard part. Um, once you get those in, though, they you that's the majority of the people that are doing the research. That's the that's the material they want. Doesn't matter if I say that while I'm pitching it. For some reason, that's not believed, right? I don't know if they're on Twitter. I guess I'm a big Twitter person, but it was trust black people, trust black women, right? So if you if you just tried it, things might 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 work out. Just just give it a shot and just see what happens, right? I'm a black woman. I'm telling you that this should be in the collection. Once it's in the collection, it's 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 now a thing, right? Because that researchers know this is here. Um, and it's just, it's, it's tough though, because the hardest part is to let something go when you know that the next institution is going to be so, depending on who they have there, it's going to be so lucky that they got it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ethel, you're writing your first manuscript, Books and Beats, The culture, Cultural Kinship of Street Lit and Hip Hop. Can you share why this project is so important to you and what can readers expect from this project? Well, um, I, I, I see this as a book to myself, my, my younger self. Um, I wish that there were books like what I'm trying to write that intentionally grounded the, the, the work that the, these books and understand from a place of understanding but because quite often with street lit in particular um, there is this kind of dismissal of it and it's similar to what happened with hip-hop music and uh, the broader culture um, and, and when people were presenting it as a, a passing trend or a fad that was happening and so this is my love letter to you know 13 and 14 year old black girls that love black books and that saw these as ways to, uh, these books as ways to be able to understand the world around them and to be able to come of age in a world that didn't believe that they should exist or be who they are and um, so I'm really hoping that my book gets into the right people's hands you know I I'm contending with a lot of different politics. I am a tenure track professor, and so I, I have certain things that I have certain standards that my book has to meet, and oftentimes those are oppositional to the kinds of communities that these texts were written for and about. And so I'm just hoping that I can find somewhere in the middle to land. So, Ms. Troutman. As the co-author of the Queens of the Renaissance series and the founder and publisher with Le Legacy Lit, what led you to committing over 15 years to publishing books by and about multicultural voices and social justice? Um, I just do, I'm someone who doesn't like to be unhappy and I can't suffer, so those are the things that I love that I feel passionate about. Uh, so I made a, I was able to make a career about it by being very honest with my um, publishers that I worked for and I think that's how it and I also had a good uh, foundation like I worked my first boss was a black woman editor she was a senior editor uh, I was her assistant and she was basically doing about 40% of the list um, <laughs> at the imprint and uh, our imprint was the I don't know if you're familiar with this book called The Secret 
uh, atrium, the secret. Oprah loved the book, and it was, it was massive. Um, but we published the secret, and my boss was the only black um, editor. But we did some really great stuff, and it's just inspired my whole career. And I've been able to work with people like John Lewis, who inspired Legacy Lit, the imprint, because of you know when everything happened with George Floyd. I was working from home, of course, and I was like, oh, God, somebody's going to call me from HR. They're going to call me. I'm the only executive black, the only executive editor there that's black. Um, it was like another editor who, she was like a, 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 like a, just a regular editor. I was the executive one. There's just one of me. So I was like, they're going to call me. And I said, what should we do? We don't know what to do. I've been here before, and I was like, you know what, when they call me, I'm going to have a plan for them. So I wrote up a proposal for Legacy Lit over the weekend. They did call me, and I said, oh yeah, I do have something for you. I think you should at least start a new imprint at the company to, uh, if this is all going to pass. So um, here's my plan, and I was able to get it through. It wasn't easy, but um, I just thought it was a way that I personally could help others and create something that hopefully can bring some sort of stability um, to to this endeavor that we're now on in publishing. Um, starting with Ms. Rokan, what has helped you get to where you are in your career, and what advice would you have for others who want to follow in a similar direction? Uh, family. <laughs> family, I mean, seriously, my family, I would not be a writer if it was not for my family. So it doesn't really help to say, have a good family who's willing to support you while you, you know, decide a week after grad school that you want to write books. Um, <laughs> but it's that, but no, truly um, learning both your craft and the industry. Because uh, I know a lot of writers go in, you know, just bright eyed and thinking everything's going to be great. Uh, it's great to have that, but um, they also, became very cynical very quickly because it is not that. Uh, as you can you tell after hearing us speak for an hour, you know, it's a hard industry, uh, very hard for writers of color. Uh, so just go there knowing that it's going to be a struggle, but it's also worth the struggle, usually. Uh, worth the struggle. Um, and yeah, just learn the industry as much as you can um, and learn your craft because you have to have a good book first before she'll buy it. Yeah. Sure. Um, I would say trust yourself. I knew I wanted to research street lit. I knew I wanted to do that since I was 14 years old. But I had, a, I had to go through a string of people that told me no over and over again. But I trusted myself and I'm so glad that I did. And have some thick skin because no one can, can hurt. You know, they, they talk about how words can't hurt you, but sometimes they, they do. You know, they, they, they feel personal. You know, when, when someone is telling you that something that you know deep down in your soul to be true, it's not, that, that can be shaking sometimes. But if you can, you can quiet those voices and hear what your soul is saying, you'll be just fine. Ms. Um, I would say uh, listen and then be willing to walk away. I think um, I had a lot of different jobs in publishing. A lot of people, as we talked here, they have a very streamlined career where a lot of them move actually from the Midwest to New York and get these jobs and then they just stay there for years and forever. <laughs> And that's why it's really hard to get a job as an editor because some people really stay a very long time because they love what they do, uh, but it creates less opportunity. Um, so I've had positions or situations where I definitely had to move around a lot and it just allowed me again to be more clear about what I wanted. I, I started doing nonfiction because I was working at a small publisher. I will not give them the credit of saying the name. That's how they're really bad. Uh, there's a whole Vanity Fair piece about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I got to do whatever I want because they basically paid authors nothing. And um, I had, you know, just wanted the health insurance for my son. 
So I was there doing whatever I want, but I got to work with people that I had long admired. And I was, I, I just got really in tune with the fact that I wanted to do books um, that would actually change the conversations on social justice. And then I was just doing my thing. I actually quit the week that somebody called me from Hachette. The publisher called me for a job. And I was like, yeah, I'm available. <laughs> uh, I quit that publisher because I couldn't, I was going to become an agent. So um, I just think, you know, have your truth. Be willing to walk away. You might be able to do something else. and um, But navigating with that truth is the most important thing. Yeah, along those same lines, I would just say give yourself permission to pivot. So, I mean, a lot of people discouraged me from going into um, librarianship. Um, it was, I guess you could call it my second career because I was like a little younger than I am now when I decided to go to library school. Um, but what I didn't know when I decided to go to library school was that I was already a librarian before I became a librarian. I was already already an archivist. I was already, you know, my whole life just, you could tell me anything and I got a book for you that you should read, you know, or um, I'm at my grandma's house as a kid and I'm like, Grandma, can I just, you know, look at your photo albums? And then I would see beautiful, gorgeous pictures and I would take it and stick it right under here <laughs> because I was going to preserve them. It wasn't stealing, you know, when she would find out she would be furious. But then I would say, but Grandma, tell me about these people. Who are these people? So then she, you know, that softened her. And then she would say, you know what, I know you'll take care of them. So I never had to do this anymore. <laughs> she would just say, you know, take what you want. I know you will take it. And I still have them to the day. So, so yeah. Um, I would say go to library school. And <laughs> I, I was always told, like, you know, it doesn't pay well. Um, I was even told, like, you, you don't, you know, get those jobs that are like, uh, you know, you're a librarian for African American collections because you'll get stuck on this African American track and they'll never <laughs> hire you to take care of non black books. And I'm just like, so give yourself permission to the pivot. Like, if that really is the case, okay, I'll meet that challenge when that comes. But I have not found that to be the case. Um, people are going to tell you all kinds of crazy things. The only thing they did tell me that was true is that libraries, libraries don't get paid well. <laughs> <laughs> So, for all of you, um, if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be and why? That's easy. For me, I would have become a librarian um, a few years earlier than I did. Um, you know, like right after like high school, I, I flirted with the idea, but I was like, nah, like who's a librarian? I'm not doing that. Uh, and then when I finally said, Tina, do what you want to do. I wish I had been doing it all along. Uh, I always say I wish, I, I mean, I would have, not I wish, because I don't even know if I actually would do this, but this is what I would tell my younger self, to become an agent, a literary agent, because they get, they make the money in publishing. Nobody else makes their money. <laughs> they get royalties on everything. Her agent is getting royalties on every single book. If it turns into a movie, they get royalties on that, 50% here, 50% there, on all of these authors. They, they, they're the ones having the multiple houses, taking the big vacations, uh, working for themselves. Um, so I just think the agenting, there's not, I mean, I, I mean, there's only just like a handful of black agents that I know about. It's a real area that there's a lot of opportunity in um, that I don't think a lot of people take advantage of because it's really hard. You're working on commission, uh, building your list, you have to learn how to sell and have the, you know, the ability to just you know, work on commission, just like a car salesman or something, but it's harder. Um, but once you get in a groove and you have certain success, it, it pays off in the long run, and you can do it forever. Like, you can't, um, no one's gonna fire you because you work for yourself, you can't age out of it. And another thing I would have told myself is to actually just be a writer and not worry about um, getting a job, because I know you have to get a job, but I felt in my situation, as a black woman who was the first college grad, like I had to go now and be the responsible one. But I think if I would have still done it and put a lot more attention on my creative self and had faith in myself, then I would have been able to still find a way um, and not lose time.
If I could talk to a younger Jacinta, I would tell her, you're not lost. You're just wandering and wandering. And that's okay. Um, and you don't need to try to guess who you'll become because you'll never, you'll never imagine what your life uh, will look like. And it's gonna be a lot better than you could ever have hoped for. And so just take the journey as it comes. Um, it's funny that you would mention the Asian team because <laughs> I would tell myself to listen to my agent. Uh, I've been with my agent since 2005. I've already told him he can't go anywhere for another at least 30 years. Um, but when I look back on my career, every misstep I've made, it's because I did not listen to my agent. He always tells me, it's your career, I'm just guiding you. Um, but I allowed myself to be, you know, taken in by, oh, and all money is not good money. That's the other thing I should tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> because it was, you know, publishers will sometimes throw money at you and you just don't want to say no because money is nice. But when you've had an agent who's been doing it for 40 years, he can tell you when, you know, that's not good money. You are not going to want to do this. And I found myself in that position more than once and like I said every misstep has been something that I've done when my agent has advised me not to do it so just listen to your agent yeah so for our final question before we get to questions from the audience um piggybacking off the last question uh do you remember a specific experience where you wish that you had done something differently and if you were to do it over what would you change Signing that last contract with Harlequin. Okay. Yeah, that's just it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, like I said, not all money is all money is not good money. I I did sixteen books with Harlequin, um, and I actually paid them back some money um, because I just refused to finish the last three books on the contract. So I had to pay them back and. I had to pay back the agent money too because once they get their 15% it's theirs and it's like if you decide you don't want to do those books well you decided that so I had to pay back not just my money but the money they paid my agent too because he didn't you know not turn in the books I did uh, so yeah that would be the, the one thing if I'm being completely honest with myself I one of my biggest regrets is getting to the end of graduate school and hesitating. I, I never considered any other career but teaching. I had I, I grew up around teachers, and I I always assumed that I was going to be a teacher. But you know the the finality of defending your dissertation and walking across the stage really I don't know it it shook me up, and and all of a sudden I was very insecure about whether I would be a good teacher or not. And so I went and I did a postdoctoral fellowship as an administrator for diversity, equity, and student success, which was a disaster. Um, because my, <laughs> the, what I estimate as diversity and impactful diversity and what the organization I worked for wanted from me were misaligned. And I was, so frustrated with the work that I was doing. I was good at it, you know, I, I had success with it, you know, but I, I didn't like it and I didn't like myself. And then I finally, you know, bit of the courage to start applying for tenure track jobs. Again, there was also the fact that I didn't get a tenure track job the first two times that I, I went on the job market. <laughs> um, um, but the third time was the charm. I don't know what the difference was, but I, I had multiple offers. I was very surprised. And when I got into the classroom, the light bulbs that I saw going off in my students' heads, the kinds of connections that they were able to make, the astounded look on my face when students came to me and said, Dr. Southall, I think I want to go get my PhD because I see that you have yours, has made all the difference for me. And I know that I am doing the work that I am supposed to do with my life. So I just, you know, I wish that I hadn't have taken that two year hesitation. Uh, I feel regret when a book that I passed on 
is super successful. <laughs> and the one that I passed on was Tiffany Haddish's memoir. Oh. I was like, the agent was trying to really convince me. He was like, listen, Krishan, it's hard to convince me of things. I was just like, he said, Krishan, Krishan, she's going to be in this movie with Jada Pinkett. And it's huge. It's huge. They love her. Everybody in Hollywood loves her. I was like, I don't know her. The book is not funny. I don't know what this is. It's sad to me. It's a sad story. You're saying that she's a comedian. Like, why would people buy this? And whoever, like, I forgot who got it. They gave it this beautiful cover with the unicorn that was funny. And I, every, you know, we would go to the editorial meeting and we always, every week, look at the New York Times best songs. And there she would be again. <laughs> Number one. Like, like, that could have been my big bonus. I was, like, <laughs> I was a huge, but uh, yeah, that was always, uh, it's usually when I pass on something that was uh, uh, just amazing. For me, I, I don't have any regrets. Honestly, I think I came into my friendship at the right time because um, I had all the life experience to bring into the library. Um, I know people still just don't know what goes on in those places called libraries, but it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and I only worked in uh, not public libraries, but academic libraries, and it's still very much like public libraries because there's just so much happening. You have these freshmen coming in there and once they attach to you, boy, you got them, right? That's, they're coming back. They're not even coming in there for a book. They just want to tell you about the grade they got and everything. You're like, I'm trying to, let me check this, these 40 people out. Then we can talk about, you know, but it's, I love that. You know, I love people. And so, um, you know, I, when I um, was growing up, my mom didn't like take me to the library for story time or anything like that. I had, I, I, I didn't know that there were black librarians. I mean, it just wasn't a thing. So I knew that I loved reading and I wanted to connect. I wanted people to love it too. Um, and just like everything that the library has to offer, I wanted to like shout it out at the roof by the top so everybody could know about it. Um, but I didn't experience that. And so I just, I guess that, that propelled me even more to want to be a black librarian so that you know others can see that. Um, because I, I did it. So, yeah. So before we wrap up, we'll open it up for the audience to ask questions. Please wait for a Riley Center team member to reach you with the mic so our viewers at home can hear your question. As a reminder, due to COVID safety protocols, we will hold the mic for you to speak into. Oh, my name is Sulay Mohammed. I'm an instructor at LSU. Uh, and I had a publishing question. Um, a lot of times, if you're not a celebrity, I know you talked about Tiffany Haddish, but if you're not a celebrity and you want to break out into publishing your book, um, it almost feels like you might have to sacrifice authenticity in order to make like that higher um, income or, or vice versa. And so I was wondering maybe what your... Um, what your feedback would be for someone who wants to publish a book. Um, would you suggest that they get an agent or go that traditional route or maybe utilize Amazon or the likes to self-publish to kind of get their um, audience up before they go the traditional route or maybe sacrifice the traditional route altogether? What do you mean by authenticity, sacrificing that? Um, so I remember I did a stint at a Auburn University and when I was writing stories, I'm from DC, and I was writing stories that kept that authentic, like, authentic DC accent and, and just the way black individuals carry themselves. My feedback from my professors and also my fellow peers was that like, you know, one story in particular, um, a girl was winning a scholarship at the end of the story. And they're like, how can a girl curse and talk like this and also be winning a scholarship? It does not seem realistic, right? Whereas we know, you know, we have beautiful people that talk how they want to, and that doesn't not, that doesn't negate their wisdom. And so that's what I mean when I say authenticity. Oh well, I don't think you should sacrifice that at all. I think um, I don't think an MFA program or a writers group represents 
uh, how publishers think about things. I don't know if you agree, but um, publishers want to know, like, you, you're writing something that feels fresh to the market, so the best thing you can do is to convince them or show them in your letter that you are doing some, the first thing we do, everybody's going to hate this, but the first thing we do is we're interested in your work and we have to look at who you're like. And all the writers are like, I'm not like anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm different. But we have to do profit and loss statements. So we have to see, okay, well you're writing these stories and they have this authentic voice and what other books have been published in the marketplace with um, that, uh, all, that are similar, someone writing stories with authentic voice. We literally look at the book sales and that really helps us create the editor who's interested in you, create an argument to her publisher and to the company like this is going to sell because they really want to sell books and make profit. Everybody keeps their jobs. So, um, you know, I would just say my advice would be to still go for mainstream if that's what you want. Um, why not? I think create your, like write a great, write great stuff, put it together, try to find an agent who is doing similar work. Obviously no one's you, but look at the books that the agent is doing and, you know, so that way they'll get you. They're more likely to get you. They're able to sort of guide you a bit better and, you know, help you even edit before they submit it to a, an editor. And the agent's job is to know who to send it to. So there's a bunch of editors and publishers, but they know that Krishan is the one who likes authentic stories and voices and is not afraid to do something different. So they'll know who to send it to because that's their job. They should, they're, they're supposed to know the publishing landscape way better than you. It's not a huge industry. There's like four major publishers right now. Um, and they should know where to place you. And they usually don't waste their time on people that they don't think that they can sell because their job is to sell. Uh, again, it pays their bills. So they always get a bunch of writers submitting their work. But if they take you on, that means they really believe that they can sell it, which is a great place for you to start in. And um, they can't control whether an editor actually acquires the book, but they do know, you know who to send it to. And so look for an agent who is doing the sort of books that you like. And, the, uh, and an easy way that we always advise people to find someone is if you're reading a book and you really like it, go to the acknowledgement page. They, everybody thanks their agent um, and their editor. So go and look at who the, the agent is and contact them about your work. Hello, hello, my name is Karen Lewis. I'm a student engagement coordinator at the Manchester School of Mass Education. I want to ask Ms. Juvenet, what was a typical day in library school like? Ooh, it's fabulous. <laughs> 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 I mean, well, we, I mean, a typical day. Well, I mean, I was working full time. I was working in a library at the time. I was like, look, I promise you I'm getting my library degree. Can I get a job now? And they're like, okay, and if you don't get this degree, you're out of here. I was like, that's not going to happen. So um, I work full time, and a lot of my courses are online. So um, it was, it was, it was great. I mean, I got to be with like people who also wanted to learn about libraries for a couple of hours. I, I loved it. I loved it. Still keep in contact with my little cohort, and um, it's great. I mean, now there's such a um, I mean, I have, I'm sure you, you all do too in your fields, but um, you know, we know how to contact all, well, especially like black libraries and the black library network. Um, but as far as my cohort at, at my library school, it was, it was great. I mean, you're learning about how to, you know, learn about the theory of information, all the nerdy stuff that I, I was really looking for. Um, so I, I enjoyed it. Thank you for the question. Any more questions for we read? No? Okay, can we please give these up? Oh. oh, wait. Hi, everyone. My name is Oscar Williams. Um, I had a question about something that we brought up earlier having to do with the George Floyd effect. Now, I didn't think about it because I'm, I'm in the master's program at LSU, but I was a digital advertising major in the undergrad. And one thing that always 
luckily that I was seeing as years went on is how um, companies would always go out and start doing advertisements or promoting stuff having to do with um, Black Lives Matter or any type of black organization, but it never felt right. It always felt off as if they're only doing it because they know that if they don't do it, they're going to get in trouble. And whenever you started mentioning how it was going about publishing of books and then all the high expectations they're expecting of black authors, my question became then is when do you think in future years that it will be to the point where they're actually acknowledging their talents and not acknowledging them because of their ethnicity? When we have our own. Pretty much. Sorry, there's not too much more to it, you know, that it, unless the, there is a, a I, I can go on about my stint in diversity work. Uh, it, if there is not true integration for not just black voices, but minority voices writ large um, in, in meaningful ways, not just kind of um, the, the ways that are visible, but systemic change, then we're going to still be talking about these same problems into the future. No, your answer is absolutely correct. I mean, that is why everything has had to have a, a, a black one, right? Because if you're not going to value, see the value in our things, then we're going to create our own. So that's why it peeves me when white people um, want to say, well, but that's racist, that you would have your own group. We, we didn't need our own group if you do how to act in this group, right? We, we don't need the, the NAACP. We don't need the BET Awards. We don't need any of this stuff if you all would give us the awards that we deserve at this, at this award show. This, is, this doesn't have to be your award show. And then we have the black one. This could be the award show. And you really, you, you, you don't, you're not racist about it. But since that's the case, what, what else do, what are we supposed to do? So, I'm a romance reader, my favorite books. Yay! I'll read. Um, so, I've read like so many books. I've read a lot of books with really diverse characters, but like, not from a lot of diverse authors. So, do you feel like <clears throat> white authors can like accurately portray minorities in their books, or like are they doing like a disservice to these groups? So, I am, that's always been a big question. Um, who like, who gate keeps who writes what? I always say that you write what you want. Um, just be prepared to suffer the consequences if you choose to write someone of another race or ethnicity and rely on stereotypes and such. That's kind of what uh, I've seen. Because there was pressure, again, with the whole George Floyd thing um, and Black Lives Matter. I can remember publishers telling authors we need to have more diversity in the books and they were literally pressuring their white authors to include uh, characters of color in the books. Um, and I had friends, you know, white authors who were afraid. They were like, I don't want to mess this up. And I told them, look, I'm not going to be your sensitivity reader. Uh, I'm sorry that your publisher is making you do this, but um, yeah, people can write what they want, uh, but they also have to contend with um, what they are taking from other authors, mm -hmm. because for every white author who's writing characters of color, there is an author who is of that race or ethnicity who has, can't get their books published. Um, because, you know, you mentioned 85%. <laughs> they are as, you know, the thing is when you see these romances and such, um, when you do have one published by a black author, the publishers like to put those books front and center because they want to show how diverse their line is, but it's really only five authors of color who are doing it. But you know, they put their faces out there so that people can say, look how, you know, diverse we are, but it's really mostly white authors, it still is. Um, and yeah, when they choose to publish books with 
characters of color in it, they are taking a space from uh, an author of color. But I think they can still write them. They need to, um, because we live in a, a world that is, you know, it's not all white. So in order to have a book that is more authentic, I love books that are set in New York and, you know, all white. Uh, you know, you can't do that. Uh, but they, so I don't have a problem with them including those characters. But they just have to make sure that they are not relying on stereotypes and such when they put them in the books. Yeah. But yay, romance. We do. Um, I mean, you asked about romance, but with nonfiction, it is also pretty interesting because uh, I'm, sometimes I'm really happy. I'm like, oh, God, thank God you have a black editor. Because that, what you're writing, is like not good. And you know, no one means to, but I just think that um, that's the value of having diverse voices in any team, like if you, I would just also suggest having um, not even just sensitivity readers, but, you know, making sure your team is diverse as a writer. You have a team because you have an editor and you have a publisher. Um, I don't know, there is there is going to be teams around you, like your, your writing groups and everything. So make sure, so, you know, it just help. it would just help to have that. Um, because I, I find that a lot of my authors writing memoir they do get very nervous about writing about, you know, black people in their lives or like I had a book recently where I said every every black boy in your book right now is angry and um, and it's just like they seem really bad. They're always beating on you. And he said that's how it happened. Um, but I said it's not but I said if a reader saw this, they think that all black children are like that. And that is not what I don't think you're trying to say. So you really need to go and look for the humanity of those situations and those boys. Why were they beating you like that? Because they had experienced things in their life maybe. You guys are all in, in a situation where you were angry. Um, but you just, I just think it's an issue if you're just showing that they're just hitting on you. Um, throughout your whole book. So it was, you know, those sort of conversations came up and I think he handled it in the end. So before we rant, can we please give these wonderful ladies a round of applause? I would thank you for the applause. I would love to give you an applause. You did an amazing job. Unfortunately, that's all we all the time we have today. I will be turning it over to Dr. Slocum, director of the Riley Center for our closing remarks. I'm on the stair here. Well, thank you, Trinity. And you did do a fantastic job. And thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, it was wonderful to hear your stories and uh, it, it, incredibly inspiring. Um, so the Riley Center, our main mission is to talk about contemporary issues in media and public affairs. And diversity in publishing is certainly one of those. And this is a, a program that has been talked about for at least five, four or five I've years? I've been here for four years, so Okay, me. sure. But we, <laughs> yeah. we had someone over here who was also talking. Um, and so uh, it's, it's fantastic to see it finally happen. Obviously, COVID kind of kept us from doing some of these things. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. And um, especially thank you to Gina, who we weren't sure quite if you were going to make it. Um, so I also want to thank Kelsey for putting this together. All right, all right. Dr. Megan Sanders for, for helping us. And then all of our, uh, just so you know, the Riley Center uh, is run mostly by graduate assistants and interns. <coughs> um, the folks who are here, uh, we've got Ashlyn over here. Thank you very much. Oh. And then Laura and Millie. Oh. And there are two other folks that are not here with us right now. Matt. Maddie. Maddie. Oh, we, <laughs> <laughs> We've grown a lot over the last year or so. Um, so, you know, 
if you want to watch this again, it will be uh, on the Manship School YouTube channel. Um, and we also have a ton of other events, especially touching on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, including our Racism Dismantling System series. You can access all of those on the Manship School YouTube channel. So please uh, take a look at that. And then um, I would also love to just encourage you to join us in the future for our events. Uh, we, we take diversity, equity, inclusion really seriously at the Riley Center. So we'll have plenty of other programming that will touch on things that probably interest you. So again, thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey because it sounds like we have some things to do with. We do. Um, so Legacy Lit uh, sent us uh, a few copies of You Gotta Be You by Brandon and Kyle Goodman, who's one of their authors. Um, and we're gonna give away three copies. So Ashley, you can hold them up for us. Ooh. All right, so I went randomly drawing uh, off of our registrations and our um, day of check-ins. So our first winner is Celia Muhammad. Uh, our second giveaway winner is Jay Jordan. <laughs> I'll let Ashlyn get to you before I do the third one. <laughs> Alright, and the third one is Idris White. Okay, cool. Um, well, there's food and drinks in the back. Feel free to have some um, and meet our lovely panelists for a little bit before they go back to their hotel.